When the farmer comes to town with his wagon broken down, oh, the farmer is the man who feeds them all. If you'll only look and see, I think you will agree that the farmer is the man who feeds them all. Oh, the farmer is the man, the farmer is the man, lives on credit till the fall. Then they take him by the hand and they lead him from the land, and the middleman's the one who gets it all. Good evening, K Squid listeners. It's every other Sunday again, and you're listening to Sustainability Now, a radio show focused on environment, sustainability, and social justice in the Monterey Bay region, California, and the world. Today's show was pre recorded for broadcast at this time and is somewhat different from the norm. I'm at Whiskey Hill Farm, which operates in conjunction with Bloom Distillation on Calabasas Road, just north of Watsonville. Dave Bloom, the di director and CEO, and I will be doing a walking interview and tour of the farm, talking about its permaculture and regenerative agricultural practices, as well as technological innovations connecting alcohol distillation and organic agriculture. Whiskey Hill Farm is a 14-acre organic farm uh, on the site of a former cut flower nursery. The farm employs polycropping, permaculture techniques in six large greenhouses to create food forests of multi-layered polyculture. Dave is CEO and Director of Research and Development at Bloom Distillation and Whiskey Hill Farm. He's the author of the critically acclaimed book, Alcohol Can Be a Gas, and he has been engaged in one sort of farming or another for more than 40 years. Dave, welcome to Sustainability Now. And so what are you trying to do here at Whiskey Hill Farm? And, and you know, broad sense. Well, I think we're trying to demonstrate uh, what people kind of in vague uh, generalities call regenerative agriculture. Now, back in the 70s, I started using that word uh, to distinguish between what I was doing and so-called sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. So what does sustainable means? Well, you can often hear the argument well, so that seven, seven generations from now, the people then have the same level of uh, inputs and access to raw materials as we have today. And I thought about that, and I talked with a Native American elder in the Blackfoot tribe about it. I said, it doesn't, doesn't feel right to me. It feels like there's something missing there. He goes... The details. <laughs> well, he said, it's a good idea, but when are you going to fix all the stuff you broke? first. So sustainable means don't wreck it any more than it is now. Mm -hmm. And regenerative means we need to improve and return to fertility the lands we've damaged. So yeah. it's not good yeah. enough to just stop wrecking. We yeah. need to build, you know, uh, uh, back the fertility of the planet. And so that's what I've been doing my whole life. So, but, but this was a cut flower farm before you took it over. And, it was. And what my question is, what was the status of the soil or the condition of the soil when you arrived? They used, um, gosh, fungicides and herbicides and pesticides and miticides and rodenticides and every side you can think of, okay? So the soil was completely sterile when I moved mm. in here. Mm. It, it, I would have an easier time growing food on Mars than I did inside these greenhouses. And I have designed growing food on yeah, Mars. Tom NASA's mentioned that. To that, that. that that's your... But, uh, <laughs> so what we had to do is we had to do some radical soil building. And we started a major compost operation here, intercepting waste plant matter from all over the county and uh, building compost to inoculate the soil. And I concocted uh, a 40, 40 species uh, solution of bacteria and fungi, which I inoculated the soil with. Mm -hmm. And these, the combination of the organic matter, which is what the organisms feed on, and those organisms made it into a living soil again. And now we have, um, as you will see inside, some pretty amazing results from the soil that's only a few years old. Now, it just proves that we are clever monkeys and we can repair what we've damaged. Okay, well why don't we go into the first greenhouse and you sure. can tell us what's what's in there. So we're going into, is a football field size, size greenhouse? Is that the That's pretty metric? close. Yeah. yeah. A um, football field is roughly an acre. 
Uh, okay, so. So uh, this is a one acre greenhouse. Now, one of the first things you're going to notice walking in here is we have some rather tall corn. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a giraffe uh, level rather than elephant level. Uh, yes, it's about 16 to 17, 16 or 17 feet tall. And it's at the end of its life. Um, we did this without any fertilizer. None. Okay, because the years of building up organic matter and, uh, and of course, all the organisms that eat the organic matter and then poop out what they've eaten, even though they're bacteria and stuff, that's the fertilizer, you know. And, of course, earthworms eat up the organic matter and leave fertilizer. So we didn't add any fertilizer to grow this crop. But we actually grew several other crops prior to this crop and crops with this one. So when we first planted this, this broadleaf plant here, which is called turmeric, and it's at the end of its life now, it's drawing down all of its juices down into the roots, which is, you know, how the plant re reproduces, just like, say, potatoes or um, ginger, etc. All the juices go into the roots, and so all this beautiful growth that they had, and all the oils, all the oils here that were in the veins are going down into the root. But before we planted that, there were a few other things we planted. We quick planted a crop of lettuce because it took about a month for this to sprout. So we immediately seeded lettuce. We got a crop of lettuce, and we. Then, as soon as, as we were taking the lettuce out, we were transplanting in basil because the little shoots of this plant were just coming up. And then a crop of basil came up. We harvested that. And then we planted the corn and beans. So this is not just a, a polyculture. In other words, growing more than one thing. But it's also a relay cropping system. In other words, one thing follows the next in a system. Now... Polyculture isn't practiced by uh, modern um, agriculture because it, it requires digital harvesting. And by that I mean 10 digits, okay? If you have multiple crops growing, there isn't a piece of machinery in the world that can go in and dig the ginger, dig the turmeric, harvest the corn. It can't be all done by machines. Machines can be pretty smart, but... Um, handling so many different crops in the same row now can't be done. So the thing is, machine agriculture makes sense if you're looking for five cent a pound corn so that you can make 50 cent a pound cows. But, uh, but when it comes to making food for people, polyculture wins every time. In, um, you know, locally here in Santa Cruz, Steve Gleason did a, a very good study on the corn, bean, and squash uh, polyculture, yeah. which is practiced all over Latin America. And when he looked at how many grams of food on a dry weight basis were produced by that combination of crops, it was quite a bit more than a pure corn, scientifically managed, chemically farmed field in the Midwest. So what he proved is using you know, almost Stone Age agricultural knowledge, we were able to get two or three times as much food per acre as we do with the best science nowadays. The difference is removing a labor from the calculation. So by able to being able to use big machines, we now can eliminate people from the growing of the two major crops in the United States, which are corn and soybeans, which are almost exclusively used for feeding animals. Right, right. Um, so out of corn, you know, basically 90% goes for animal feed. Right. Perhaps 3% um, goes for things like modified food starch. Uh, a little bit goes into dog food. 1% uh, goes into things people eat. In other words, breakfast cereal. Um and corn chips, mm -hmm. right? And then, so I wouldn't really consider those food. Those are kind of industrial, you know, cardboard products, projects, yeah, you know. Yeah. 
And then there is 1% of corn that does go for something I think is really valuable for people, and that's called whiskey. So that I do consider food. And, uh, and so out of all that corn, very little of it becomes anything people use unless you count uh, eating meat. And, uh, well, if you're trying to feed the world, meat is not the way to do it. Right. Political so decision, how no, we I, design our, our agriculture. Yeah, I understand. I understand that. So, so who do you have then harvesting the crops here? I mean, who does it? Well, we typically have six people here that harvest the crops. And we grow a diversity of crops, so we hopefully don't have everything come at the same time. Right. And that way we can keep up with it. So right now we're about to start harvesting these dried corn stalks. Uh -huh. And we're going to sell those for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas decoration. Oh, and huh. my gosh, we make four or five times as much on, on that as we do on the corn itself. Now, I don't have any right here, but the other way we make corn into something that's higher value is we uh, is I mean, here's the a beginning ear of corn and we inject these ears of corn. Let's see. This one doesn't have what I'm looking for. We inject these ears of corn when they're growing with a fungus, and it's called um, corn smut. And it's in Mexico when your corn has this fungus, it's considered uh, your corn has been kissed by God, because what comes out of the out of the ear of corn are these pillow-shaped funguses, which are worth three or four times as much as the ear of corn. So by culturing, see, it's another polyculture. We're right, adding yeah, in a fungus yeah, yeah. now, and it's, it concentrates and makes more soluble the protein that's in the grain, that would be in the grain, and makes uh, things like vitamin B12, which are not in the corn, so it balances a critical nutrient without meat mm -hmm. in kids and that kind of thing who are very sensitive to a shortage of B12. So people who have you know, lived with corn, beans, and squash, they go, well, how, you know, they're vegetarians. How do they get their precious nutrients that only meat can provide? Well, the answer is fungus, you know? And so a little bit of fungus goes a long way. Huh. And, uh, and so, so what I'm trying to say is polyculture is more complicated than it initially looks. I Let's take a, a short break. You're listening to KSQD. 90.7 FM and ksqd.org streaming on the internet. Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and today I'm speaking with Dave Bloom at Whiskey Hill Farms. We've just been talking about uh, polycropping, what would you call it? Polycropping. Polyculture. Polyculture. As opposed to monoculture. As opposed to monoculture. It's the milpa system, right, basically, that you're, you're duplicating or trying to uh, improve on. Well, I'm and using the principles of principles, it. Principles, uh-huh. So, for instance, you wouldn't find ginger or you wouldn't right. find turmeric right. in a normal milpa. So the reason I grew corn here wasn't so much that I wanted to eat corn, although I wanted to sell the wheat lacoche or corn fungus I made with the, uh, with the corn, but the corn provides filtered shade. It's just like a thin, a thin canopy of a forest. Huh. This big leaved plant, whenever you see big leaves like this, they're getting hammered with lots of sun. And if you look at where they would grow in nature, they grow at the edge of the forest. In other uh -huh. words, they're adapted to limited Partial sunlight. Shade, right, right. So, so by you know, I could either buy shade cloth, which would be the normal commercial mm -hmm. farmer's viewpoint, mm -hmm. but why should I gr buy shade cloth when I can grow my shade and eat my shade instead of buying some 
uh, petroleum-based product to create shade. Oh. You know, so, uh, and of course there's, as I told you, there were many other relay crops in the process, but this was the whole season shade strategy here. Mm -hmm. Who, who um, so who do you sell the, the products to, the, the food to? Oh, uh, all the health food stores buy my turmeric. It's one of the most popular uh, products right now uh -huh. uh, in the health food market. And of course, ginger, we all use in everything. Um, there's also beans that, there's some remnants of beans that were growing earlier in the season. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. um, you know, and, and over here we have a selection of other uh, crops that we're growing. So, uh, you know, the idea is that we sell it to local stores. We sell it to national brokers. Like mm -hmm. the turmeric goes all over the country. Uh -huh. uh, you know, last, oh, I guess it was three months ago, we sent 2,000 pounds of turmeric to the Whole Foods in Maryland across the country, wow. right? And you think, oh, that's a lot of energy. But the only place they would get it otherwise is from India, which is a lot more energy. So growing it here makes mm -hmm. it local, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, can, can comparatively local you know yeah. only 3,000 miles instead of 11,000 yeah. miles yeah. Um, I but, like to think that growing stuff in the soil where you live is, is a is less tangible but an important aspect of nutrition of a crop I mean in theory though you could do the same thing in Maryland right uh, if you if you not all maybe not all year but well you make a good point but ha I got I came to the conclusion to grow turmeric in a different way when I first bought this property, I walked in here and I said, well, let's see, what surpluses does this property provide for me? And I'm looking at all this glass and I'm wiping the sweat off my brow and I go, oh, the surplus is heat. So what can I do to use the heat that this site provides for me? So uh -huh. I go, well, that's tropical. Right. So uh, I started growing tropical crops knowing that I have an advantage over those who have to airship them from another country. Right. So I, you know, I take advantage of what I have, which is the extra heat. And so that's why I started growing this crop. And it turned out to be exactly the right choice because uh, it doesn't grow really anywhere in America other than maybe, well, in Hawaii, which is tropical, and a little bit at the south of, uh, south of um, Florida. But those would be outside, right? Those not, would be outside. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. here I am. Here you, you know, are. Right here. Yeah. So, okay. So what should we go and look at next? Well, let's have a little fun. Let's go into the tropical rainforest. Okay. So we're walking through the width of the greenhouse. It's, uh, it's quite a walk. Uh, I can see now why it's described as being a football field. Just on our way to the tropical forest, uh, just here's a little garden here. Now, you know, we have a little bit of farm equipment. So this only took about eight hours to um, prepare the soil and plant, um, plant all this food. So we got, you know, the kind of stuff we all like to eat. You know, this is uh, arugula. You're going to have to slip that under your mask, Ronnie. So this is a nice spicy winter vegetable. Cilantro, which my workers use in everything. They're mostly from Mexico. Here you'll notice mutt, onions, and carrots. They both repel each other's pests. Onions uh, repel carrot, uh, carrot thrips, and, um, and carrots repel something on onions. But the other thing about them in planning and designing how you farm is that onions roots go this way and carrot roots go that way. So they use different parts of the horizons in the soil so I can pack more of them into the same space because it's not all the same plant. So that's an advantage of polyculture where you can pick different vegetables that take different soil horizons and so there is no competition for nutrients. Hmm. Okay. Um, so here we go, this is the uh, a bit of a tropical forest here. We'll go to the other end since it was planted first. So here we have um, trees and uh, low plants and some cacti. 
um, I guess we'll find out what we're looking at, right? Yes. Okay, so we're going to walk into this uh, forest here, which is uh, far more pleasing than walking into a soil, a, a, a field of soybeans. But we have many things here. This is a tamarillo, sometimes called tree tomato. Uh, these are, I believe, yes, these are giant golden berries. And this is a papaya. Uh, and here are some bigger papayas here. Um, so let's go take a walk through and I'll identify a few things. But I, what I want you to realize is everything you see as you're, follow, as you're following me is a fruiting plant, an edible fruiting plant. So you can see some fruits of flowers and fruits forming here. What is this? this plant? I believe this is, I don't know which one. <laughs> Let me explain that. I'm not an expert in tropical agriculture per se. I don't know all the species in here. I know some of them. But this whole thing is a volunteer effort by Santa Cruz tropical fruit uh, aficionados. Hmm. And they were all trying to grow these in little greenhouses in their backyards scattered all over. And we offered the space here to the group to bring their, uh, bring their babies in and mm -hmm. plant them where we could keep it warm. Mm -hmm. And so they've been working here for weeks now, planting all these different uh, different crops hmm. and within a year they'll all be producing fruit now like this one is a very popular herb right now this one's called ashwagandha it's an herb from India um, the leaves are used uh, and the roots are used to make kind of a calming sedative blood pressure reducing medication hmm. you know um, it goes on and on in terms of the things that are medicinal here. This is a mango. This is a dwarf mango here. So you can see there's one forming right there, mm -hmm. a little baby mango. Mm -hmm. So that'll be covered with mangoes this year. Uh, again, this is another papaya. And by the end of this uh, upcoming year, this will be covered with papaya. Um, you know, you can see as we wander through all the different canopies, the different levels of light that uh, the different plants experience. Some have really broad leaves that shade what's underneath, and then other things underneath that make use of that shade. Um, anyway, you get a sense of it here. There's coffee in here. There's many of the things that we think are valuable, but... Uh, but the idea is that all of this is fruiting food, and this is an enormous amount of food that will be here starting in about a year when the plants get more established. This is only about six months old. Most of the plants wow. came in here a foot tall. So when they got to the, the climate that they really like, they've gone crazy. I wanna, I wanna ask a sensitive question. Are you making a profit on all of this? Uh, the answer is seasonally we are. Uh, the turmeric is quite profitable mm -hmm. and keeps us funded but uh, much of the year, but a lot of our money is going into our research on alcohol and things. So yeah. if the farm was just an entity in itself, we'd be wildly profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, in this greenhouse, uh, we have about 40,000 square feet. In this greenhouse, we can grow about 50,000 pounds of turmeric. Now, 50,000 pounds of turmeric times $7 a pound is $350,000. Compare that to an acre of corn, which makes maybe, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars at most, and we're making 350,000 here. We're absolutely profitable on turmeric and on some other crops I'll show you. But um, that's not all we do here, right, and the right. profit from the turmeric goes to fund our science. Mm -hmm. There is a break in the recording here because I forgot to push the record button. We've walked from one greenhouse to another in which there are a number of ponds, including a materials digester that produces methane, courtesy of the alcohol distillation process. The methane is then used to feed a pond of filtering cattails. 
once I've got the cattails growing, well, I can go ahead and harvest them. And cattails have a horizontal root. It's not a root, really. It's a stem called a rhizome. Now, you'll see small little dried up roots that come off the rhizome and go down into the mud. Now, um, these rhizomes are full of starch. So per acre, we'll get uh, the alcohol made from this starch will be 7,500 gallons. Is that a lot? Well, uh, you know, that's per acre. I'm sorry, 7,500 gallons per acre. Corn only gives you 300 gallons per acre. Hmm. So it's 20 times more yield per square foot than corn. Now, the uh, you can tell there's... There's uh, I there's uh, starts in the middle. You see that dark spot there? That was where I put a drop of iodine on the end of the stalk and uh, the rhizome, and it turns the starch purple. So we can, you know, prove to ourselves that there is starch in there mm -hmm. by seeing the purple. So <clears throat> what we can do though is go a bit further. So we've got seven thousand five hundred gallons of alcohol we're making from the waste of the alcohol plant being absorbed and you know made harmless by this marsh now the next thing we can do is take the protein out of the leaves the leaves are where much of the nitrates end up and the phosphorus and become a lot of protein just prior to when it goes to seed because those compounds are always the best stuff that a plant puts into its seeds now cattails these are cattail seeds here. They're all very, very tiny. And what cattails do to distribute themselves is they're wind distributed. <sighs> so each one of those little seeds up there will blow in the wind. And when it falls on a wet spot, it goes ahead and roots and makes cattails. But the protein is in, mostly in there, but it's also in the leaves, which are now dried up here. If we want to get the protein out, which is a good idea, we can take the leaves and grind them up, and then we add alcohol. Remember alcohol, what we make back in the distillery? So we add alcohol to it and, and stir it, and at some point the protein migrates out into the fluid and then drops to the bottom as pellets. So we can then um, scoop those out, and we can use that for animal food or human food and we get 15 tons per acre of protein is that a lot well corn only gives you two tons of protein per acre so it's seven times as much protein and of course you're cleaning up the water at the same time but there's more <laughs> okay so these leaves are pretty much pure cellulose now and a little lignin so we can grind these up until we have a fluff like this. And then if we put this through a briquette machine, they get compacted into a wood pellet, which can then be used for fuel. So in New Zealand, this is the system we're gonna to use to clean up the dairy runoff from 12,000 acres, 12 million acres of dairy land where the runoff from cow poop and manure uh, poop and uh, urine is polluting all the rivers and the ocean in, on the North Island of, of uh, New Zealand. But the dairies are powered by coal. So these made into briquettes can replace the coal and make the whole process completely, uh, you know, uh, regenerative. And the protein they have to feed the cows to make up for if they were harvesting all this milk, they need more than the grass provides. They bring in palm kernels from overseas at a high energy cost. And of course, there's a lot of ecological problems with growing African nut palms, but they don't need it anymore because they have the protein made from their own manure, right? Via becoming a plant. So this is how you do regeneration. You look at all the resources you have, you figure out how surpluses can end shortages and bring systems into balance, and then they're able to uh, sustain themselves uh, and and repair the land at the same time. Let's take a, a short break. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM and KSQD.org streaming on the internet.
Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and today I'm speaking with Dave Bloom at Whiskey Hill Farms. We've... So we have a little bit of an interesting uh, uh, thing to look at above us, and it was invented by scientists at UC, Ber uh, UC Santa Cruz, and you'll see that there's solar panels that are red. Now, they're red for a reason, and as we all know, there are three primary colors. There's yellow, blue and red and all the other colors are made from those three colors I so thought, I thought red came before blue that's how I read it it could Yellow, be they're, blue, th they're okay. primary the three are I'll, primary I'll let colors. you go on this one I think. oh well thank you so if you look over in the distance at those passion fruit there you'll see they're a nice dark green now you, you those of you who haven't thought about this much why is that green it means they are somehow you know intrinsically green but that doesn't explain why you can see the green. You see the green because that plant is reflecting yellow and blue. So the yellow and blue we see as green, that the, those two wavelengths together look like they're green. So the plant isn't green at all. The plant is reflecting green away from itself. So what it likes are reds and purples and stuff like that, just like these panels. So these panels are designed to let the light through that plants want and then take everything the plant doesn't want and send it out through our uh, electrical connection to the grid. So we're using uh, sunlight to go ahead and uh, partially power the grid and still provide the light spectrum needed by the plants. It turns out when you limit the amount of stress inducing uh, colors, you end up with 30% more yield. So, you know, here's huh. a high-tech, interesting thing that works. Now, how do, where would you find this kind of thing in nature? You find it, and you'll find it a little further on in this greenhouse, under a light canopy of other plants. In other words, the other plants reflect away most of the yellow and blue, yeah. and the light that comes through the leaves are the bright color you know, right colors for the plants underneath. So let's go take, we'll go see those as we go this way. Um, what is this? There's a pond here with, uh, covered with oh, algae. That's right. It's covered with duckweed and algae. Duckweed's a floating plant, and algae, of course, is a, a plant that lives in the whole water column, usually. Mm -hmm. So... So this is covered with duckweed. The nutrients at the end that come out at the end of that pond go into this pond. The algae uses up the remaining nutrients to grow and at the same time gathers solar energy because like any plant, they're photosynthesizing. So what's photosynthesis? It's carbon dioxide and water. So carbon dioxide is carbo, water is hydrate. And then solar energy glues that together and makes sugars. Sugars can be made into many things. So the carbohydrates are about 50% in this algae. So it's mostly starch. You can make bread out of this algae, and Native Americans did. Um, but it's also a high percentage of protein. So we, we can get all that stuff for ourselves and do something with it. But there's another thing that happens here, because when plants take in carbon dioxide and they keep the carbon to make carbohydrates, what do they let go of? Oxygen. oxygen right. Plants are the opposite of us. Right. We breathe in, in, in oxygen, out CO2. They breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen. If it wasn't for plants, we'd all be dead. So. Here's a bunch of oxygen, a surplus of oxygen, a surplus of food. Gosh, what should I do with this algae? Well, I pump it over into this pond, which is loaded with catfish and uh, crayfish. And so in here, you'll see it's a very different color because most of the duckweed has been eaten by the fish. So, uh, you know, there's parts of the world where they say, you know, a, a farm without a fish pond is not a farm, okay? Because it's the recycling center at the end of the chain. So let's just quick review. The alcohol plant made alcohol. The liquid from that went into the methane digester. 
it made gas, it made fertilizer, or soluble fertilizer that went into the cattails. That went down to that end, growing all the cattails normally, and then into this pond where the remaining nutrients feed all this algae and oxygenate the water. And now we put it in here for the fish to have something to breathe and something to eat. Now, obviously these aren't meat-eating fish, they're vegetarian fish. So, um, fish actually are, are quite a bit better uh, animals for heat feeding people than cows are. Because cows, well, takes 10 pounds of corn in rough numbers to make one pound of cow. But that also means they make nine pounds or more of manure, right? In other words, a lot of waste goes into the production of meat. When you feed this animal food, this algae and stuff to the fish, it only takes a pound and a half of algae and that kind of thing to make a pound of fish. Huh. So it's much better wow. than the 10 to one of cows. And that's why they call fish what they call them because they're efficient. So, <laughs> but no. So anyway, our next step is to be growing crayfish in here. Now, when I say crayfish, the other term for them is freshwater lobster. They get about this big and they don't grow in the ocean like normal lobsters. They grow in an algae pond like this and they eat the um, bacteria and the fish poop Remember, we're trying to get one more thing out of the system. That small amount of feed that was wasted as fish poop is eaten by the crayfish. So the crayfish are ready to harvest in three months. They're a very fast crop. Uh, and the taste of freshwater um, lobster is uh, considered superior to that in the ocean. And it comes without mercury. In the ocean, being filter feeders, the, the lobsters become impregnated with mercury, which makes them very unsafe to eat. So this is a much better product, and uh, we have constant um, inquiries from Asia to sell this to them, you know, by air freight, but we're gonna sell it just to local restaurants when they reopen. Now, you, think I, you would think I'm done, but there's one more level. Inside the freshwater lobsters is this special, super soluble, highly charged calcium, and they call that structure in the gastrolith. It's about pea sized. Why is it there? Because lobsters have exoskeletons. If they get a, a, a bump or a crack in the exoskeleton, they can get infected and die very fast. So this gastrolith is like. Uh, I don't know, epoxy to a crack. It goes right to the broken part and builds new shell really fast so that the lobster doesn't get infected. Well, this form of calcium isn't found anywhere else in nature, just in these shellfish. So sports doctors are taking these gastroliths, grinding them up to powder, put them in a little water and inject them into uh, athletes that break a bone. And in days, the bone heals and they can go back to playing football for the corporation. So they pay $1,000 a gram for gastroliths. So by the time you start looking at all the profit, first we get the natural gas, then we get the cattails that produce 7,500 gallons worth of alcohol, 15 tons of protein and wood fuel. And then we get all this algae with oxygen we feed it to the fish, we get fish, we get fish poop, and then we get crayfish, which are worth money. And of course, we wouldn't sell them live. We'd cut them open, take out the gastrolith, and sell them pre-cleaned. And there was one more product. That whole chain, there's one more product. We take this water and we irrigate our fields with it. And all the nutrients that have made their way down the chain of conversions to this point now feed our crops. If we fed alcohol producing crops, we'd have a closed circuit, right? We'd have the crops going back to the distillery to make more alcohol. But I'm not a big fan of the closed loop. That's a survivalist concept, you know? We really need regional, you know, regional energy flows and self-sufficiency, not individual farm closed loop. That's that's, you know, that's for, for the survivalists that want to, you know, 
uh, continue on after the end of the world where they need to close their loop. We want to be interdependent, not independent. We want to be able to trade our crayfish to um, somebody who has something we want. We want to sell our fertilizer like we do from the alcohol plant um, to other farms to go ahead and uh, fertilize their farms with our surplus. We can call it a waste product. And so, you know, when you do that, you get back from them in different ways. You know, we needed to have a piece of equipment taken off a truck. We didn't have a big enough forklift, but one of the guys that we get fertilizer to brought his big forklift over and lifted that 12,000 thing dollar, dollar thing off the truck. Those kind of interactions count just as much as the pedestrian interactions of what we can sell. So it's important to realize that you don't cook, you don't produce just products, you also produce services when you have a farm. Now, let's go a little further. This pipe here, stainless steel pipe, galvanized pipe actually, um, receives the hot water for the plant. You'll remember we showed you a 4,000 gallon tank full of hot water. So the hot water goes into this pipe and if you come down this way, you'll see that we have these blue tubes that come down from the pipe. So they go four feet underground. They go all the way to the other side of the greenhouse and come back up into another pipe. You can see them down there. So the thing with this is, this hot water goes down the tube. It heats the soil four feet down. Doesn't release any water. It's just like a radiant heat tube in your warm floor. And so the soil gets warm. Now, <clears throat> why is this important? If you take a look at a greenhouse, and this one's been covered by dust from plowing next door, so we're waiting for the rain to clean it off. But if I'm growing a crop in here, and I have to keep it warm so it doesn't freeze on those nights, that former farmer used to use a thousand dollars a night worth of natural gas to keep his greenhouses warm. So to keep the plants warm, they used to have to heat the glass, the steel, the air just to heat the plants. Mm -hmm. Well, if I just put my hot tubes under the soil and the soil is nice and wet and the, the soil moisture gets up to 60 or 70 degrees, then the plants sending their roots down there can pull up 70 degree water and internally heat themselves. And it could be 20 degrees out, outside and they go, we don't care, we're plenty warm inside. So. I would use less than 10% of the energy of the former farmer used to heat the whole environment just to heat the tissues of the plants when I let the plants do it for themselves by just storing the heat underground for them. You know, you never told us where the what heats the water. Well, there's many different ways to heat the water. Most of it comes from waste heat or surplus heat from the alcohol plant. But, for instance, in the summer, the temperature at the top of the greenhouse will be 120 degrees. We can blow that air out, went into the greenhouse through a heat exchanger, and heat the water to almost that temperature and uh -huh. put it in the tank. Or use it, reuse it right away. There's many places to find heat. Well, I remember you showed us uh, water heating in the compost piles. Yes, that's the other way to do it. It's a large amount of heat. We usually have a compost pile on the other side of this wall, which we're just now starting to build and we put plastic tubing in it. We run water through the tubing with a pump and um, that hot water, the water comes from the tank, the big tank we saw, we pump it through the pile, it goes up to 120 degrees and we put it back in the tank. Mm. So the heat of composting, biological heat, right? It's not, it's not based on a fuel, it's biology reproducing, giving off so-called body heat that heat gets up to 120 and we can harvest it. And when we do it, we keep the pile cool enough so the bacteria and funguses can keep reproducing because if it gets too hot, it kills them. So we take the surplus heat and we store it in our tank and we can send it wherever we want on the farm. And where does the water go after it's, it's gone? Through? It circulates back. It's just, it's, it's, it's it just circulates back, okay. yeah. Okay. There's a pipe down here further all the way down, then it comes back over here to the compost pile. Uh -huh. Let's take a, a short break. You're listening to 
KSQD 90.7 FM and KSQD.org streaming on the internet. Hi, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz, and today I'm speaking with Dave Bloom at Whiskey Hill Farm. All right, so this is this is a canopy of vining plants. Now, you're going to see this one here. It's called Chayote, and you'll see it all over, out about 15, 20 feet, and around the corner it goes around 15 to 20 feet. That's all from one plant. It's a jungle plant in Latin America. It grows all through the trees, okay? And uh, the, for some people, this is their basic vegetable in, in the rainforest. And it's plenty of starch, a lot of calories, and nutrients. But uh, further in, if you look further in, you'll see that most of this are passion fruit. And let's see, here's one. There are little animal tracks in the beds there here. There are. What is that? You know? Coyotes. Coyotes. Oh, coyotes. Yeah, we have coyotes in here because we have rabbits. So we leave the doors open at night. And the coyotes come in here and eat the rabbits, you know? And they sing. <laughs> yes, they do, don't they? Okay, so this is passion fruit. Take a taste of that, Ronnie. Oh. Just the pulp inside and the seeds. Just go ahead and chew on that. Oh, chayote over here. Tart. <laughs> yeah, let me hand this one along. You just suck out some of that right there. Mm. Isn't that amazing? So, so remember I talked about oh, having a light shade? Well, mm -hmm. this is a little more than a light shade, okay? Yep. I, I planted too many, so I have to thin them out for the next year. But uh, this crop will provide filtered shade when it's less dense. And that means all the crops underneath will do a lot better because partial shade increases uh, increases output. But <clears throat> these fruits are worth a dollar a piece. A dollar a piece. And looking at thousands of fruits going down in this one bay. So, um, you know, gosh, everyone thinks farming has to be really hard, really backbreaking work. But next year, we're going to put the trellis right up against the glass, and these will grow up along the glass. And then underneath, we're going to put fishing net with small holes down to the sides. And these things are ripe when they fall off the, the bush. So they'll fall off. They'll fall under the net. They'll roll down the net into a bucket. And this is a self-harvesting plant. Okay, But the you know, we can get when this is only one year's growth. This is a very willing plant. So when we get it established next year up there to its permanent location on trellises up high, it will probably start putting out about uh, seven tons per acre. So ah, not so, so many tons. I mean, other things put out more tons, but that's 14,000 pounds. And there's about eight passion fruit per pound. So that's going to be $92,000. And I haven't even planted anything in the soil yet. So $92,000 sure beats buying shade cloth. You know, $92,000 in income. So then underneath, we plant the, tr the plants that like shade, like turmeric, etc. So we're using all the sunlight. We're not wasting most of it, which is what happens with most crops. So thinking ecologically, you want to imitate on some level a forest, which is the most productive ecosystem 
compared to anything you do on a farm. So we're just doing both. We're creating a farm uh, below and a forest above and harvesting all the products. And so that kind of polyculture hasn't really been demonstrated before in a big way around the world. We've seen multiple crops grown on the ground, but thinking about what's over and what's on the ground and what's under, you know, you get a more total picture of what's possible as a polyculture. So, so um, Dave, there's one, th one thing that you haven't <coughs> talked about, and that's the piping of the carbon dioxide yes. into, under the crops, and I wonder if you would describe that to us. Well, uh, I'm trying to think where I can show that to you. It's... Um, We'd have to do that in another greenhouse. Let me show you there. Well, you have to see the setup. Okay. So let's right. go over back to the first greenhouse and I'll show you about this here too. Okay. One of the main things about greenhouse growing is you have to make sure there's enough carbon dioxide for the plants to breathe. So either you have to open the windows or you got to provide the CO2 some other way. And so what we're doing in here is remember our distillation process produces an enormous amount of CO2. So we can pipe that over and instead of sending water through these tubes, these tubes are drip irrigation tubes. They have little pinholes in them that let the water come out. We can, instead of water, swap further back up the line and send CO2 through these lines and then it hisses out from the lines in between all the plants and the plants can use it to breathe and make more plant material. We invented this a few years ago and many people have copied this now because it's such one of those things where you have a distribution system sitting there in front of you and you go well I can distribute CO2 just like I distribute water. You know uh it goes in the face of all the guys selling to greenhouse users panels of diffusers up there and the CO2 is supposed to come down to the ground. You just use your T-tape. You know, there's usually a simpler way to do these things. And uh, CO2 triples the amount of food per square foot. So uh, I don't have a side-by-side -side comparison for you here, but we had... Uh, Last year we had sugarcane growing in one of the greenhouses and without CO2 it got to be six feet tall. With CO2 it went right up to the top of the roof 18 feet tall. So um, it's a potent potent plant food carbon dioxide and it's a good thing because otherwise we'd all be dead right now if we didn't have plants breathing our carbon dioxide. So uh, even carbon dioxide isn't bad it's just where you put it. Well, listen, Dave, thank you so much for the tour and for being on Sustainability Now. Great. And, uh, and I hope once we get through the uh, pandemic, you can welcome visitors back to the farm and show them all of this wonderful stuff. And that's Sustainability Now for Sunday, November 29th. This tour of Whiskey Hill Farm has been edited down from its original length of 75 minutes in order to fit into the designated time slot. But I will upload the entire interview to the K-Squid podcast site and other podcast platforms. We also took video of the tour and hope to have that online sometime in December. In two weeks, on Sunday, December 13th, my guest will be Daryl Molina Sar Sarmiento, Executive Director for Communities for a Better Environment, a 40-year-old environmental justice organization with offices in both Southern and Northern California. The mission of CBE is to build people's power in California's community of color and low-income communities to achieve environmental health and justice by preventing and reducing pollution and building green, healthy, and sustainable communities and environments. That's Sunday, December 13th, 5 to 6 p.m., right here on KSQD 90.7 FM and ksqd.org on the Internet. As a reminder, shows from the 5 to 6 p.m. Sunday slot are broadcast the following Tuesday mornings from 6 to 7 a.m. And if you'd like to listen to previous shows, you can find them at ksqd.org backslash sustainability now and on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Casts, among other podcast sites. Thanks to Emily Donham for today's engineering and to everyone else at the station who make K-Squid your community radio station. Until every other next Sunday, 
sustainability now. When the farmer comes to town with his wagon broken down, oh, the farmer is the man who feeds them all. If you'll only look and see, I think you will agree that the farmer is the man who feeds them all. Oh, the farmer is the man, the farmer is the man, lives on credit till the fall. Then they take him by the hand and they lead him from the land and the middleman's the one who gets it all.